Thank you, Mark, and good morning. <clears throat> we are continuing our studies in Jeremiah, as I've explained in the um, weeks previous. We're not going chapter by chapter. It's titled Studies in Jeremiah. We looked at chapter 35 last week, and we are looking at chapter 36 this week, but we'll skip over a few chapters in the weeks to come. Uh, the Bulletin has chapter 36, verses 1 through 32. I'm not going to read all 32 verses. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, and then we'll look over at verses 20 through 26. But we will cover the entire chapter in the exposition. But beginning with verse 1 of chapter 36, In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll and write on it all the words which I have spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations from the day I first spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. Perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them in order that every man will turn from his evil way and I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. And so Jeremiah called his scribe Baruch who wrote down all the words that Jeremiah dictated to him and then Baruch took the scroll, he went into the temple and read the scroll publicly to the people. When some of the officials learned of this scroll, they had Jeremiah or Baruch write, read it to them, and they realized they need to alert the king because this is a call for repentance, and repentance begins with the king. And so we read in verse 20, so they went to the king in the court, but they had deposited the scroll in the chamber of El Shammah, of Elishama, the scribe, and they reported all the words to the king. Then the king sent Yehudai to get the scroll, and he took it out of the chamber of Elishama, the scribe, and Yehudai read it to the king as well as to all the officials who stood by the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning in the brazier before him. When Yehuda read three or four columns, the king cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it into the fire that was in the brazier until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. Yet the king and all his servants who heard all these words were not afraid, nor did they rend their garments, even though El Nathan and Deliah and Gemariah pleaded with the king not to burn the scroll. He would not listen to them. And the king commanded Jeremiel, the king's son, and Sariah, the son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdiel, to seize Baruch, the scribe, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But the Lord hid them. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Early in the 4th century, in the year A.D. 303, the Emperor Diocletian began Rome's 10th persecution of the church. What was different about this one was he not only went after Christians, he went after their books. The Emperor decreed that the scriptures should be consumed by fire. Earlier persecutions had sought to deprive the church of its teachers. Now it was trying to deprive it of its writings, the source of the Christian's faith. Now that's significant for a couple of reasons. First, it showed that by this time, the year 303, the canon had been formed. There was a, a body of literature accepted by the church as Holy Scripture. 
There's good evidence from the writings of church fathers that the canon had actually been formed much earlier. But this is added proof that the inspired texts were recognized early on. But also, the attempt to destroy the Bible was a recognition of its importance. That it is the source of the Christian's faith and the authority of our lives for our thought and deed. Now, why is it our authority? Why is it so important to us? Because it's God's revelation. That's the apostles' teaching. That's Second. Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Literally, Paul wrote, all Scripture is God-breathed. That's the term that's in, translated as inspired, but it means God-breathed. It was breathed out of God and breathed into the human authors. It was it was His Word breathed through their minds, their personalities, their experience, so that the writings of these authors was uniquely theirs. Moses' writings were his. The, the writings of Isaiah were reflective of Isaiah's mind and personality, as were Paul's and Peter's and James, and John, and all of these show the characteristics and the understanding and the mind of all of these different writers, but all of that was brought through them by God in a way that preserved the purity of His Word, so that the Scripture is His revelation. Perfect. God speaks to us through the Bible. So an attempt to destroy the Bible is an attack on God's Word and an attempt to silence God. Wittingly or unwittingly, that's what the emperor was doing. And so the authorities broke down church doors and they entered Christian homes. They took their Bibles and they had a great book burning. But Diocletian wasn't the first ruler to burn Bibles. The first was a Jewish king, of all things, Jehoiakim, one of the last kings of Judah, who took a knife, cut up Jeremiah's scroll, and tossed it in the fire. It's recorded in Jeremiah 36. The incident is important because, again, it shows the importance of Scripture. It is so vital to God's people, that the enemy believes it must be destroyed. But this incident and chapter is also important because it also shows that all attempts to destroy the Word of God are futile. Diocletian couldn't do it, neither could Jehoiakim. At the end of the chapter, we read that the scroll was rewritten with the addition of a curse on the king. Jehoiakim died, but the book remained. God can't be silenced. His word is indestructible. All this took place, we're told in verse 1, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah. At least this is the beginning of these events that unfold. And that was the year 605 B.C., the 23rd year of Jeremiah's ministry. It was the year that Babylon defeated Egypt at the Battle of Carchemish on the Euphrates River and became the superpower of the ancient Near East. The Babylonian army then began to move south into Syria and toward Judah. No army could stand before them. It was a time of uncertainty and a time of fear for the Jewish people. In that year, God spoke to Jeremiah and He told him to write down on a scroll his ministry from its beginning during the reign of Josiah to that present time. Now, a typical scroll measured 30 feet in length and 10 inches in width, and it was wrapped on, a, on wooden rollers and read as it was rolled. And so this is what was done. This is what was written. 
It was uh, not clear exactly how much um, was recorded on this original scroll. Not all of the book of Jeremiah was written, of course, because much of Jeremiah remained to take place and, and occur. But from, these, from the beginning of those events to this time in Jeremiah's ministry, it was written down. What seems to be the case, though, is that one thing that was certainly written from what we gain from reading our passage is chapter 25 of this book, where Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of Judah is foretold. And there in verse 11 of 25 we read, this whole land will be desolation and horror. And we know that was included in this book because in chapter 36 verse 29 the king reads that and that is what incenses him so much about this prophecy. But this is the first time Jeremiah's prophecies were written down. God wanted his message and ministry preserved. And the reason is given in verse 3. Perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them in order that every man will turn from his evil way, then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. God's great work is the work of grace. It's the work of salvation. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's Ezekiel 33 verse 11. That's a sermon that would be preached not many years after this in the land of Babylon. And so he says, again in Ezekiel, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? That is an expression of the heart of God. That's his desire. That they not die, that they turn. And that was his desire here. Jeremiah's prophecies were not intended only to terrify they were given for the purpose of saving people. There is a gracious purpose behind God's threats. And we cannot ignore the fact that there are threats in the Word of God, Old and New Testament. And that's not a popular thing to preach. Judgment has never been, it seems, a popular message to preach. Churches today don't like to speak of hell, don't like to speak of the lake of fire, don't like to speak of the wrath of God. But it is a reality. And people need to be warned about the consequences of unbelief. It's all through the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. John 3, verse 36, that is a verse that occurs after John 3, 16, that great verse on the love of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What a great statement. But the chapter ends on that warning he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now that is not said to torment people, but to awaken them. And by God's grace, they will hear it. They will wake up and believe. That was the purpose of Jeremiah's scroll. And so he called for his scribe, Baruch, to write down all the words that Jeremiah dictated to him. Baruch means blessed. And he is a man who appeared first in the book of Jeremiah back in chapter 32 and verse 12. He is his scribe and we'll see him later in our studies. After dictating the prophecies to him, Jeremiah asked Baruch to go into the temple and read them to the people. Because he... Jeremiah was restricted and could not go there. We're not told why not, but likely he was considered by the authorities to be a troublemaker. He's had a ministry of some decades now. So he sent his scribe in his place, and according to verse 6, wanted him to go to the temple on a fast day, a time when large crowds would gather and could hear the message. It may have been that a day of fasting had been called for due to the threat of the Babylonian army that would soon be at the gates of Jerusalem. And if so, then you can imagine that their minds were 
were prepared for a message from God. Uh, Jeremiah hoped that the reading of the scroll would convince the people and would cause them to respond. We read in verse 7, perhaps their supplication will come before the Lord and everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and the wrath that the Lord has pronounced against this people. Baruch did what Jeremiah instructed him to do. He went to the temple and he read from the scroll. Verse 9 states that it happened in the fifth year of the reign of Jehoiakim, so a year or so after he was told to write this, uh, his, his uh, prophecy down. In the ninth month, which is December of 604, Babylon uh, by this time had won more victories. So the temple was uh, full of worried people there for this fast when verse 10 says, Baruch read from the book. He stood at a place that overlooked the crowd, one that a man named Gemariah gave him access to. Evidently, Gemariah was an ally of Jeremiah's, one of the remnant that God had preserved. But nevertheless, though he had a, an ally there in Gemariah, this took courage on the part of the scribe because when the court officials heard it, they summoned Baruch and they had him read the scroll to them. And when he did that, they were afraid. Literally, verse 16 is, they trembled a man to his companion. They trembled because they recognized this was a prophecy. And it was serious. That was confirmed when Baruch told them that Jeremiah had dictated it to him. So they knew the prophet had spoken which meant the Lord had spoken through his servant. And so they had to report this to the king. It was given to lead the nation to repentance. And as you read through the scriptures, you see repentance begins with the king. It began with Josiah when he came to the throne. Before that, it began with Hezekiah. And so they needed to bring this to the king. And so they did that. The king had to hear it. But these were righteous men. And they knew the king. They knew that he was not a righteous man. They knew his nature and had just heard through the reading of this scroll of the warnings of Babylon's conquest of Judah. And they knew that none of this would go down very well with Jehoiakim. So anticipating the worst, they advised them to go into hiding. Verse 19, go hide yourself you and Jeremiah, and do not let anyone know where you are. Then as a precaution, they put the scroll in the room of a scribe named Elishama. They wanted to keep it out of the king's hands. This is the word of God. They valued that, and they knew the king was not one to be handling this. But hearing the report, he had it retrieved and had it read. It was December, it was cold, the king was sitting in the winter house, the warm part of the palace with a brazier of fire in the middle of the room for heat. Whatever these court officials feared might happen from the king did. Verse 23, when Yehudi had read, the, read three or four columns, the king cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it into the fire that was in the brazier until all the scroll was consumed and the fire that, uh, in the fire that was in the brazier. He showed complete contempt for Jeremiah as a prophet and for the Word of God. The officials pleaded with him to stop, but verse 24 says, the king and his servants were not afraid. In fact, the king's cynicism was demonstrated, I think, in the knife that he used. It was a, a pen knife, that's how some translated, or a scribe's knife. In other words, it was a special knife used to cut sheets of papyrus and make scrolls. Jehoiakim used the very tool for making scrolls to destroy the scroll. 
And in doing that, he became the first king on record to deface and destroy the Bible. Why did he do that? Well, he hated the message on the scroll. He hated the message on the scroll because he hated the one who gave the message, which is the Lord God, who revealed it, and he tried to silence him when he heard this, maybe believing, as someone has suggested, that destroying the words of this prophecy may stop the prophecies from happening. Now, he may have had that superstitious idea, and that may be behind this, but what I suspect is really what took place here was not something as pragmatic as that, but it was simply an act of utter disdain and contempt for the Lord. He didn't want to hear what the Lord God had to say. It was to use Paul's words, an aroma from death to him, not life. And so he destroyed it. What a contrast to his father Josiah, a righteous king. When Josiah was king, they discovered in the temple a book of the law that had been lost. It was brought to Josiah, it was read to Josiah, and when he heard this lost book of the law, perhaps the book of Deuteronomy, he tore his robes. He was grieved that God's word had been lost and neglected and not obeyed, and he feared greatly the consequences of that. His son was the opposite. The king and all of his servants who heard all these words were not afraid, nor did they rend their garments. In spite of the example of Josiah, in spite of the instruction he gave to the nation and his family, instruction Jehoiakim would have heard, in spite of all Jehoiakim saw and knew, he rebelled against the Lord. And that was the nation generally. That was Judah. That wasn't true of everyone. Some who were there were afraid. Verse 25 states that Elnathan and Deliah and Gemariah pleaded with the king not to burn the scroll. But he's completely indifferent to their pleas. No fear. Instead, he ordered Baruch and Jeremiah arrested. But... Verse 26 states, the Lord hid them. Now that last statement, the Lord hid them, is uh, worthy of a sermon in and of itself. The, the, The most wanted men in Judah were safe within the king's city because God hid them. He never forsakes us. In the most dire of times, We have that promise. He will never leave or forsake us. And what this shows from these two men and their example is we are always safest when we are obedient, regardless of the circumstances. The Lord hid them. Then we read in verse 27 that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah again. After the king had burned the scroll and the words which Baruch had written at the dictation of Jeremiah, And what the Lord told them to do was write a new scroll. Verse 28, take again another scroll and write on it all the former words that were on the first scroll which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, burned. Now what does that show? That opposition to God's word is futile. He's the living God. He cannot be silenced. Men have tried down through history and always fail, ultimately. Does it make life better or more secure for those who do that, who seek to destroy the book, who try to destroy the book, who defy God? Does it make life better for them as though though if removing Him from their thoughts removing his words from their minds and before them, destroying his scroll or book as if that, that really changes anything. That, and so that alters reality. Now, let, me, let me illustrate the folly in that. We, we've all had the experience of being in a, in a hurry to get to an appointment when we come to a dark rail crossing and suddenly the lights start flashing and the 
striped arms come down and we have to stop. It's an inconvenience. But the solution is, is not to ignore the lights and break through the barriers onto the track. Anyone who thinks that that's easy or wise, a solution to the problem is going to get mugged by reality. And that would happen to Jehoiakim and his court. They were not afraid. They didn't rend their garments. They didn't change anything either. They should have rent their garments. They didn't. And so God not only told Jeremiah to rewrite the scroll, he was, a, he was also to rewrite a message to Jehoiakim, verses 29 and 30. And concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, you shall say, Thus says the Lord, you have burned this scroll, saying, Why have you written on it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and will make man and beast to cease from it? Now, how dare you write that? Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. So he would die an untimely death and would have no descendant to sit on David's throne. Now, his son Jehoiachin did become king and did reign, but he reigned only for three months, and he was soon deposed and taken to Babylon where he died in exile without children. Zedekiah, Jehoiachin's uncle, succeeded him, but the succession through Jehoiakim's children ended as Jeremiah prophesied. And because he burned the scroll and rejected God's prophet, Jehoiakim would die an ignominious death, his body cast outside, unburied, exposed to the elements, and his family and servants would suffer judgment. Their failure is explained in verse 31. They did not listen. The chapter ends with Jeremiah taking another scroll and dictating to Baruch the words of his book, what Jehoiakim burned, God restored. What do we learn from this? A number of things. But two things in particular. God's word is invincible and indestructible. And it is foolish not to listen, not to obey it. Christians have every reason to have complete confidence in the Bible as the Word of God and the authority of our lives. The canon of Scripture was formed early in the history of the church. The word canon simply means rule or standard and refers to the writings that were authoritative and make up the Old and New Testaments. And that was determined by a strict set of rules, not arbitrary. There were rules that governed the recognition, not the making of, but the recognition of the canon. A book needed to be edifying, written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle. And so it was to be of an early date and consistent in doctrine with other books and traditions of the apostles and the prophets, Old and New Testament. Almost all the books that make up the New Testament gained universal acceptance among the church at an early date. By the end of the first century, a few of them by later in the early part of the second century. But early on, these books were recognized as scripture, as canonical. And the reason for that is spiritual. Ultimately, there were rules, objective rules that the church understood and followed, but, but there is a spiritual explanation for the Bible, and that is that the Bible, Old and New Testament, all 66 books, books of it are self-authenticating, which means 
you know that this is the Word of God. It makes itself known to one. It just radiates revelation. It radiates truth to the reader. And that may produce a response like Jehoiakim's or one of faith and reception. But it is a self-authenticating document and it is self-authenticating not only because of the truth of it, but because of the Spirit of God who is within all of this confirming it to us confirming it as true to his people. In their book, An Introduction to the New Testament, Don Carson, Doug Moo, and Leon Morris, all the authors of this book, said it was not so much that the church selected the canon as that the canon selected itself. The Bible made itself known. The scriptures made themselves known as scripture. Now, all of that is simply to say that we have every reason to believe that the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, is divine revelation and so reliable and authoritative. God has revealed Himself in the Bible and made it clear to His people through the Holy Spirit that it is His revelation. And one of the evidences of that that it is His Word, is the attack that it has been under from the very beginning. The first attack that Satan made was against Scripture, God's Word. Genesis 3, verse 1, the serpent said to Eve, Indeed, has God said? He questioned the Word of God in order to sow the seed of doubt in the heart of Eve. And the attack has gone on down through the ages because this is our authority. Our only authority for faith and practice and without it, as God's people, we're lost. We're adrift without our moorings. But Scripture is invincible and indestructible. It is eternal. Isaiah 40 verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. All of the created order will pass away, but not God's Word. It stands forever. And this chapter in Jeremiah is a reminder of that. It begins with the command to write God's message on a scroll. It ends with God's command to write it on a scroll. The Word of God is indestructible. Now that has been proven time and again. Jehoiakim used a scribe's knife and fire to destroy the book. Others have used more subtle means to do the same thing. In the 18th and 19th centuries, theological liberalism denied the supernatural and dismissed the Bible as only a human book, no different from any other religious book. Just another work of the human mind, just a piece of literature. And so higher criticism and the ideas of Graf and Wellhausen denied that Moses wrote the Pentateuch and theorized that it was the product of a whole different, a whole school of people, different editors at different times in Israel's history. So it sort of evolved and they named these editors or labeled them J, E, D, and P. So it's all the result of of, of, of the natural human process. All of these attempts, well, I should say they went on beyond the Pentateuch, they went on to the prophets like Isaiah and postulated that there wasn't one man Isaiah, there were two or even three Isaiahs that wrote over a period of centuries. Uh, the New Testament itself has come under the same kind of scrutiny and attack with different schools of criticism, analyzing it and dismissing the, the authorship of various authors and the, the reliability of these books. All of these are attempts to explain the Bible in a naturalistic, evolutionary way, which denies the supernatural nature of the Bible and undermines its authority. And that's the point. They are destructive approaches to Scripture and differ little from Jehoiakim's act of cutting up God's Word. He used a scribe's knife. Men today use misleading scholarship. Either way, it's unbelief. And the purpose is the same. 
to silence God, either by undermining the authority of His Word, of the Bible, or by physically destroying the book. But all such attempts are doomed to failure. The Roman Empire didn't succeed. Diocletian decreed that the Scripture should be consumed by fire, but his attempt to destroy the book failed. Both church and state tried to keep out of the hands of the people the Word of God, killing even the translators like William Tyndale. But the Reformation only spread, and so did the Scriptures. The Bible cannot be destroyed by kings or empires or liberal professors. It is indestructible. Jeremiah called it God's hammer that breaks rocks in pieces. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. It is living and powerful, supernatural. So we need to listen to it. That's the second lesson of this chapter. Jehoiakim and his court didn't. The people of Judah didn't. God gave the scroll to them for their good, that they would turn from evil and be forgiven, but they didn't, did not listen. As a result, calamity came on the nation. A century before, prophet Hosea said to the northern kingdom of Israel, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that was true of the southern kingdom of Judah. And that is true of the church when it chooses not to listen. The church will stand. Lord Jesus made that very clear. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church, against God's work. It will triumph always. But individual churches fail and they fall. Christ removes His lampstand from them. That's the threat that He gave to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. And He will remove His lampstand from Believer's Chapel someday if we stop listening to His Word. It's God's revelation to man. We're to listen. Now that means more than simply possess the Word of God and read it, and study it, and take it seriously, because the church at Ephesus did that, but they first love. And so it is listening to the Word of God, which is more than just hearing it, it's hearing it, and obeying it, and, and following it. That's what we need to do. And what he's made known in this book is himself and us, who he is and who we are, that he is the eternal self-existent, self-sufficient, triune God and holy creator of all things. And we are His creatures, completely dependent upon Him for everything, for every breath of life we take. Without that revelation, we cannot know reality. We are left with human reason, which is not reasonable. It's flawed, it's fallible, it's fallen. The result of reason without... The reason unaided by revelation is speculation. Not certainty. Not true knowledge. Only the Bible gives that. It is light. Spiritual light. Someone that I've been reading or read some months ago put it this way. Without that book... We no longer know what to look for and where to look in order to find the basic answers to life's first questions about man, life, truth, justice, and beauty. I think that's true. And among those basic answers is the explanation of the human problem that so plagues and troubles and confuses people today. The problem is very simple. The problem is sin. It is rebellion against God. And because of it, the human race is separated and alienated from God and alienated from itself. We're at war with ourselves and lost. But it also gives a solution, which is the Savior, the Son of God and sin bearer, 
the one who died in our place, he obtained the forgiveness that Jeremiah spoke of in verse 3. He reconciles us to God. He reconciles us to one another. He alone brings about peace and delivers from judgment and does that for all who listen, all who believe, all who trust in Him. But He not only rescues us from that peril, He, he directs us through the maze of this life, this dangerous world. He restores us. He heals our sick and confused soul. That, that's sanctification. He sanctifies us. He repairs us. He makes us whole. That's a lifelong process. It, it will not end in this life. It will only end when we enter His presence or we see Him at His coming and we're transformed. But it's a lifelong process, but only happens through the study of God's Word. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. That heals and makes whole. Do you want to have a growing faith? I make this point frequently, I think, but it's an important point to make. Do you want to have a growing faith? Do you want to... <clears throat> Gain wisdom. Gain humility. Do you want to, to live as one ought to in the wisest and profound, most profound way? Then listen to God's Word. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. That's Romans 10, verse 17. We cannot grow spiritually. We cannot gain that wisdom. Cannot gain humility and respect to ourselves and and love and devotion and obedience to the Lord God, courage toward Him and in this world, apart from His Word, listening to it. Without it, we're lost. And so easy to drift away from it. Josiah was a righteous man, one of the greatest kings in all of Israel. He trembled before God's Word. His son didn't. Jehoiakim had heard, he didn't listen, and died. The calamity came on a whole generation and nation because they didn't listen. That's the fool's way. He thinks he can silence God because he doesn't like what God says and what he's heard in his word. He thinks he can ignore it. It doesn't change anything. God's Word and will are invincible. The train still comes down the track. Those who ignore God's voice are doomed by reality and eternally. Listen to God's voice. Obey His Word. It is His hammer. It breaks rocks. And it always falls on those who oppose and reject it. But it gives life to all who listen and believe. That's God's desire. That's His great work. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from His way and live. If your heart is like the king of Judah's, turn from unbelief and to the Lord. Receives all who do. Then continue to listen. Know God's Word. May God give all of us hearts like that, a desire to know Him, and to please and obey Him. It's the best life. It's the life He blesses. That's wisdom. May God bless all of us with that. Let's end with uh, hymn number 279 in the red hymnal, an old favorite, How Firm a Foundation, hymn 279, and then let's remain standing for the benediction. Father, we do have a firm foundation in the Scriptures You have given to us, the revelation You've given to us, and the wise and successful life is the life that follows it through difficulty. And You often call us through difficulty, but we do have that great promise in Your Word and what we just sang about, and that is You'll never forsake us. Thank You for that. Your Son is faithful. Thank you for all that we have in Christ, for his death for us, the salvation he's obtained for all who believe in him. It's in his name we pray. Amen.